2017 is shaping up to be a great year for video games. So great, in fact, that the games that just kind of randomly shower onto my inbox are actually pretty good this time. Past the penis pills and beyond doubtful donations are always a bunch of games that people don't know about, usually for good reason. But everyone's first top-down shooter, walking sim, or bad joke simulator seems to have better production values than the usual this time. Not wanting a gym to slip through those cracks is why every six months I do quick reviews and features of games I haven't seen anywhere outside of my inbox. I took a good look at the materials for 33 potential titles, I played 16 of them and then featured 6 of them, because games like Desync deserve a second chance. This is a wonderfully satisfying shooter that synchronizes music and movement to make the Far Cry Blood Dragon box art real. Adult Swim Games unfortunately decided to squeeze Desync's release into that one crazy week in March that was bookended by Horizon Zero Dawn and Breath of the Wild. Had it released any other week of the year, it's easy to imagine Desync becoming one of those darling flavors of the month, because it's a well-executed take on a classically damn good time. The Neo 80s soundtrack, also inspired by Far Cry Blood Dragon, pumps your way through a fast-paced arena shooter where camera work slows down to show off your moves, and an omnipresent scoring system rewards you for last-minute dodges and juggling enemies in the air and blasting them into traps, like you're playing some glorious FPS cross between Burnout and Bayonetta. In terms of look and feel, it is a lot like Bulletstorm with the dodge roll button, but without any of that hit or miss attempt at comedy and instead punishing and rewarding multiple phase bosses. Racking up points for nailing those sweet 180 no scope trick shots rewards you with points to be spent in the upgrade shop while higher difficulty novelty remix levels trickle along at the same time. This is the kind of game that I really wish we would see more of. An elegant cross between character action games and FPS. Whoppo was one day being a useless piece of shit who called down to the apartment front desk for an ice cream cone. The ensuing tutorial level teaches you how to pick up and carry objects and spill stuff all over the place and get evicted, and it is goddamn adorable. Returning home will have you venturing all across the lands through lighthearted but on-point humor. Past lightweight combat that's just interesting enough thanks to your heavy projectile arc, and lightweight inventory or environment puzzling that's just interesting enough thanks to solutions having this kind of deceptive simplicity to them that is wholeheartedly cheeky. Slopping your wum around feels good. The puzzles make sense, the story and lore is all funny and cute, and combat is, uh, solidly sloshy. Despite the game's hand-trembling art style, it's gorgeous in its own cute little way without any problems of conveyance blocking out which items are supposed to be background, foreground, and danger. Whoppo is a solid, by-the-books Metroidvania, but it does it with so much confidence, polish, and charm that it's easy to imagine this game being a fresh new Nintendo IP if we lived in an alternate universe. It plays kinda like Kirby, but also kinda like Yoshi's Island, because playing Whoppo is the kinda good, clean, childish fun that you rarely find outside of memories of playing Nintendo for the first time. Streets of Rogue is an early access one-man project by a relatively unknown dev and sorry but Tiny Build's choices are all over the place in terms of quality. That and the fact that it's technically not launched yet are the only reasons I can assume that this thing has flown under the radar at this point. Because Streets of Rogue currently actually does deliver on its sales pitch of being the world's only RPG roguelike action stealth shooter brawler co-op mega game. Levels are generated under the thematics of programmer art and programmer humor with the intention of building places that look like a deus ex city hub. Populated with peaceful NPCs who mill around little houses of restricted areas until the player knocks over some bottom brick in the simulation that causes a domino effect of bullshit to result. Meanwhile, the one-man dev is using a philosophy of going absolutely nuts with the quantity of items and abilities here. It's insane how many playstyles and possibilities these levels can support. Doors can be smashed, walls can be blown up, chests can be destroyed, NPCs can be hired, bribed, pacified, neutralized, distracted, panicked, or turned against each other. Players can shoot, sneak, stealth, quest, roleplay, tell jokes, and generally administer mayhem on their way to completing objectives that are less about just reaching the end of the level than they are about using open-ended interactables that require some foresight and planning to complete. Like, flip over these four switches, steal this item, neutralize 
because this NPC in particular. Now oh, these quests aren't even required to move on to the next elevator and generate your next level of rogue streets. But the game's chaotic quantity over quality nature does turn out to be a bit tempered for the sake of balance and strategy, as seen when trying out the local co-op and online multiplayer modes which are an absolute blast. The difficulty and unpredictability of a dungeon run here are both high enough that two heads are almost certainly going to be better at tackling these objectives than one. All the character abilities and playstyles it supports are so wildly different that you can really get into some strategic mixing and matching between them here. I'd imagine that slowly and strategically talking your way through a game of this depth and scope with a friend in co-op would be amazing. Yeah! Okay, this intro is rad, but it's kind of hard to explain. A little pop-up window loads the nest cart before it jumps into full screen and things get weirder from there. What? Okay. Mibbly. Mibbly's quest is truly an art. It's some quirky personality's exploration of their quirky train of thought as filtered through a generational lens of an NES childhood. Mischievously difficult, almost manic Mega Man stages challenge the player's juggling of genres and conventions in ways that remix the mental muscle memory of how you expect a decent good old Mega Man clone to work. They're the kind of levels that are hard for the first 2, 12, 20, 30 tries while you get into the rhythm of what wacky new playstyle it's asking for you, because a lot of the challenge here is more mental than physiological. Return to it days later after you know what's up and what's where and suddenly this game's really easy. It keeps that momentum up by experimenting with interesting input and layout gimmicks. My favorite being this DDR level where enemies shoot danceable button prompts. But if you keep going, you eventually have this happen! And that creativity and confidence makes this game actually one of the most mechanically stimulating, diverse, and just plain fun fan-made Mega Men I've played. Plus, check this out. It's free. They call this a demo version, but you get pretty much all the same levels as the full game, just minus a few extras. Everything changed when the Sea Nation attacked. Because now everybody's got to slash through dragon-themed monsters cluttering black and white procedural generated levels. Now this is weird. I'm highlighting this one because it's more of an honorable mention or a who to watch than a straight recommendation. Super God Studios is a new studio from Finland that deserves some attention. Mainly because the combat design in Riptail suggests that they're capable of doing amazing things with this system. Combat is paced with split seconds of patience before waiting for the exact frame to strike. Each overpowered blow careens you across the screen into danger, and you only have enough stamina to slash three times before a heavy cooldown wait. But with one-hit KOs and satisfying freeze-frame feedback, Riptail perfectly accomplishes the action game goal of making it feel good to overcome your problems through violence. It's a budget game from a new developer, and corners were cut. The lack of color ultimately results in moments where more feedback is needed than what's given, particularly when telling if you're getting hit by something that may or may not be part of the background. Procedural level generation gets the job done for the breadth of systems in your average roguelike, but here we can see why it's not a favorite choice for fast action games that demand precision. Because whatever procedure that system is generating by tends to generate levels that are way too cramped to make room for your character's high speed and long jump distances. But man. When you perfectly plan and pull off a 6 KO combo that clears the entire screen of bad guys in one swipe, it all feels worth it. 